Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome everyone and to see such a wonderful crowd. We've had a beautiful day. I think maybe we had about 300 people through uh, the house earlier today for the tours of the chapel. And uh, now we're having this wonderful event. And following this, um, we will put the chapel to the use it's meant for. Uh, which is for prayer and song. And I hope that all of you who are here for this event are able to stay and join us for evening prayer at 6.30. I'm Sister Beth Murphy. I'm the communications director for the Dominican Sisters. And I'm very, very pleased to introduce to you Anthony Rubano. It seems a lot of you know him. How many of you have ever done one of his walking tours in Springfield? Oh, goodness. I haven't managed to do that yet. So one of these days, I'm going to get on one of Anthony's walking tours. We met, actually, through a mutual friend, John Schaefer, who's an architect here in town, is the one who suggested to me that if we were going to do this, we really needed Anthony Rabano to do it. And until that point, I'm sorry to say I didn't know anything about Anthony. Um, but Anthony's area of expertise is, is mid-century modern architecture, and he has really enjoyed uh, getting to know our space and researching it, and we've enjoyed working together on that. Uh, as many of you know, Anthony is the project director at the Illinois Historic Preservation Office, and he has been a delight to work with. He presented this presentation to our sisters earlier this week, and they could not get enough of him. So you're in for a treat, as am I. I can't wait to hear it again. And uh, Anthony, without any further ado, I'm going to let you take over this microphone. Please, come ahead. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here to speak on the art and the architecture of Sacred Heart Convent Chapel. It, um, it's rather funny. I've lived in Springfield almost 20 years. I hesitate to even say that out loud. Uh, and never went into the complex. Uh, I drive by it regularly. And I always think, wow, that's really great. I wonder what it looks like. Well, and thanks to you, I was able to find out about that and, and uh, challenged to think about it a little bit. And hopefully, um, this presentation can um, give you a, a glimpse into how I sort of thought about it when I first saw it in, in, um, in a couple of different ways. And I also dug into a couple of the other uh, uh, the topic surrounding the construction or the, the design of the chapel and its art, and it's been really quite fascinating, so I do want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to dive into it just as little as I, as I did. It really is a, a topic worth further consideration. Let's see if this works. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Tuesday when I did this, we were plagued with some technology issues, but we, we overcame. Um, can we make it darker to facilitate slumber? <laughs> well, that way I can't see everyone sleeping. <laughs> so, the uh, chapel of the Sacred Heart Convent is a powerful, imposing structure. It anchors the Sacred Heart Convent itself visually, spiritually, artistically, I think I can say. Both its art and its architecture are frank expressions of aesthetics, of faith, of their time in history. They share a common starting point in modernist design vocabulary. And I'll use that word with a capital M. So in an architectural sense, modernism being that which tried to break from the past in the early 20th century and to find a new way for architecture and certainly art uh, to look from that point forward. And so they share a common starting point in modernist design vocabulary, except for one component, which we'll discuss a bit later. The building is starkly modern. It's cubic composition that is softened, perhaps only slightly, by the texture of its buff brick, the subtle veining of its unpolished Missouri marble. The same material palette continues to the interior, but with more glossiness. Polished Missouri marble and shiny terrazzo flooring contrast with blonde oak trim and stalls, stone and glass mosaics, and the luminous Dal de Vere stained glass windows. When we considered the words convent or chapel, Images like these may not be the first that come to mind. To be frank, they certainly aren't the first that come to my mind. But by 1965, when Sacred Heart's designs were in place, there had been much discussion as to what 
religious art and architecture should look like in the 20th century. Perhaps the most obvious of those discussions uh, were those of Vatican II, which encouraged a subtle shift from emphasizing a house of God, Domus Dei, to a house of the worshipful, Domus Ecclesiae. And this resulted in a deornamentation, to put it simply, of church architecture. However, arguments of modern expression of church architecture occurred well before Vatican II. Catholic scholar Edward Foley notes that even during the Council of Trent, so going back a ways, right, it was remarked that certain architectural changes to Catholic churches would be necessary to better compete with the design innovations demonstrated by the Protestants. But that sentiment did not prevail, and by the mid-19th century, clergy heavily favored art and architecture that strictly followed established rules, what we now call academicism. And look at how similar these two works are in terms of technique, despite their age difference. The one on the right, 1857. The one on the left, 1588. So not a lot changed. Well, a lot changed, but not a lot changed between the two. In a reaction against academicism in the late 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, a handful of European artists, architects, and theologians pressed for more modern ecclesiastical vocabularies. Artists like Denis and Rouault here, who were quite devout, wrote about and worked in contemporary styles <coughs> as they depicted religious themes. They rejected academicism, seeing it as sacrificing emotion to artifice. <coughs> Denis, whose work is on the left, founded a studio dedicated to contemporary religious art. In 1920, art student Pierre-Charles-Marie Couturier joined Denis' studio, and that's a oh. Well, that's half of him there <laughs> on the right. That's not an abstract portrait. It's a glitch. You can imagine what the rest of it must look like. So in 1923, still only half, but that's all right, better than none, Couturier and Denis designed the first abstract stained glass windows for the church at Le Rancy, this on the left, one of the most important early modern expressions of religious architecture. Couturier left Denis' studio in 1925 to enter the novitiate of the Dominican friars at Amiens and was ordained a Catholic priest in 1930. Couturier's Dominican superiors ordered him to continue to decorate churches. He, with the support of fellow Dominicans, there he is, that's all of him, um, <laughs> became an outspoken advocate of modern art and architecture in church design. From 1936 until his death in 1954, he was co-editor of an influential journal of contemporary liturgical decoration. He was involved in highly influential commissions, like Matisse's Chapelle du Rosaire, oh, excuse me, Rosaire on the on the left, <coughs> excuse me, and Le Corbier's Notre Dame du Haut on the right. Commissions that pushed the boundaries of both modernism and of ecclesiastical artistic expression. <coughs> Coutelier had a hand in both of these commissions. Chapel of the Rosary by Matisse that I had mentioned on the left, which was dedicated to the Dominican order, and the Church of the Sacred Heart in Odencourt by Fernand Leger on <coughs> the right. Though both projects were widely published and quite influential, Couturier's progressive efforts, supported by the Dominicans, led to an aesthetic crisis in the Catholic Church in the mid-1950s. In 1947, just previous to these commissions, Pope Pius XII cautiously endorsed modernism. <coughs> And I quote from an encyclical, modern art should be given free scope in the due and reverent service of the church and the sacred rites, provided that they tend neither to extreme realism nor to excessive symbolism, in quotes. Nevertheless, he continued, we cannot help deploring and condemning those works of art recently introduced by some, which seem to be a distortion and perversion of true art, and which at times openly shock Christian taste modesty, and devotion, end quote. So a little bit of modernism, not a whole lot of modernism, but let's just see what happens. By June of 1952, the Holy Office warned against art that was disordered, distorted, and confused, the uh, direction said. Such declarations didn't stop modern church architecture. They simply led to more discussion and experimentation. Sir Basil Spence, uh, architect of one of England's most important modern churches, wrote in 1956 that churches should reflect the time of their construction. He wrote, quote, important principles in church design 
have been handed down to us through our great churches and cathedrals, and while traditional requirements have changed very little for the older communions, architects should be encouraged to be inventive and to breathe a contemporary vitality into the various parts of a building. He continued, quote, the Gothic churches, the Renaissance cathedrals, and the Georgian nonconformist preaching houses were all contemporary architecture in their time, end quote. <clears throat> in America, one church in particular revealed how a modernist church could be poetic, <laughs> relevant, and engaging. Christ Lutheran in Minneapolis by the Finnish architect Eliel Saarinen is a beautiful tapestry of material and texture. The July 1950 Architectural Forum said of it, quote, art, science, and faith achieve a serene harmony in this little church. In purity and simplicity of form, it recalls the early Christian era, end quote. So here we see that at least to the editors of the magazine, modernism equaled simplicity, which then equaled austerity, which is the short step to religious asceticism. But unadorned surfaces and an emphasis on material texture over applied ornament were also seen as a means to focus attention on the liturgy and perhaps on the ritual, the process of the worship, rather than on opulence. Architectural modernists, especially in America, equated traditional church design with a lowering of collective creativity. So more advanced architectural expressions were sought. I asked earlier if the word chapel brought to mind images uh, like the Chapel of the Sacred Heart. But it turns out that by 1962, when Sacred Heart Convent and Chapel were commissioned, there were already very advanced examples of what a modern American chapel could look like in the middle 20th century. There were very progressive ideas of what a convent or a monastery could look like as well. These were not simplified versions of Gothic or Renaissance forms. They were wholly new architectural expressions. These expressions, often met with great critical acclaim, helped shift the public's awareness of modernism and push the boundaries of what a church and its art might look like. The tumultuous 1950s concluded with a call for spiritual renewal. In 1958, Pope Pius XII, who in 1947 warned against modernism going too far, passed away. In October of 1958, <laughs> Pope John XXIII was elected, and in less than four months, he called for the Second Vatican Council, which led to a liberalization and a modernization of church practices. By its conclusion, so by the end of Vatican II in 1965, the council asked the churches strive for, quote, noble beauty, end quote, whatever that may mean. So Vatican II wasn't the start of ecclesiastical modernism, but perhaps its confirmation or from another point of view, maybe its vindication. It would have been hard indeed to reverse the advances in church architecture to that point, especially when the advances had been so undeniably successful. The parish church in the burgeoning suburbs of America was especially suited <coughs> to receive advanced forms that reflected the attitudes of its congregation and its clergy. The first Presbyterian church in Stamford, Connecticut by the American architect Wallace Harrison is a prominent example. Harrison said of this building, quote, when you've plotted through it all methodically from the beginning, the human needs, the floor plan, the economics, the structure, you still must get an emotional reaction. The answer is to merge art and architecture. At Stanford, we did it by bringing in color and the stained glass design, end quote. As Harrison searched for an artist to provide the stained glass for this commission, he spoke with Fernand Leger, whose Church of the Sacred Heart we saw just a moment ago. Indeed, it was Leger's use of Dal de Verre in that commission that brought the medium to the attention of many would-be patrons. Leger suggested that Harrison, again, the architect of this church, get in touch with a French glass designer who specialized in Dal de Verre by the name of Gabriel Loire. Harrison sought out Loire and hired him to provide what became his largest American commission up to that time. Harrison described the result after the windows were installed in Harrison's building as being inside a giant sapphire. And I think that's a pretty apt description. If you're ever in Stamford, Connecticut, or if you're ever anywhere near Stamford, <laughs> Connecticut, I highly recommend visiting this church. The congregation undertook quite an expensive restoration about 10, eight, 10 years ago 
It is magnificent. In America, interest in Loire's work surged, prompting Loire to develop a small network of representatives in the US, which then led to many more commissions. But Loire had an active career long before Harrison hired him to design the windows at the Stamford Church. Loire had been making Daldevere windows since at least 1935 in Chartres, France. He opened his own studio in 1946 and produced leaded and, uh, and doll glass, as well as mosaics. But he quickly focused on doll de verre, the technique that made him famous. And incidentally, Father Coutelier, whose half portrait we saw a little earlier, <laughs> knew him and his work. Loire would sketch the original uh, designs. Here on the left is his original sketch, sketch for adoration, just right upstairs above the Sacred Heart Chapel's altar. And then in his studio, in Loire's studio, a team of highly skilled artisans made the cartoons, which were full-scale drawings of Loire's original sketches. The craftsmen then cut the glass to match the cartoons and created the windows themselves. Dal de Verre, literally wall of glass, was not constructed like a leaded stained glass window. Large chunks of glass are placed into position and then concrete is poured around them to form a panel. Because of their weight, these panels often have steel, steel reinforcing bars entrained into the concrete, which makes them self-supporting. So in one of the few times I'll use this laser, here are the reinforcing rods around the perimeter. In this contemporary example of Dal de Verde, this is still a medium that is very much in use. And then the plasticine mold to confine the concrete, most likely it would have been wood in Loire's studio, and you pour, let it cure, mostly take it out, and then you would clean off the surface before the concrete is entirely cured so that you reveal the glass. <clears throat> and then you just do it a million times for a, a giant church. <laughs> so by the 1960s, epoxy was also used as an alternative to concrete, and on the right, is an example of a window uh, slightly predating yours uh, in an installation in Chicago that is dal de verre in epoxy. The epoxy gives a shiny surface between the glass units. It's a you know kind of a plasticky kind of thing. The windows upstairs are in concrete, and so there is no shininess. There is just this wonderful texture with small aggregate of the concrete itself. Glass in doll windows is much thicker than in traditional stained glass, which gives a richness in color and texture that make them quite distinct. Leger's windows, this is a close-up of them in Audencourt, were of unfaceted glass, thick layers of unfaceted glass, and that gives a flatter, more graphic overall appearance. They look like Jolly Ranchers, right? They're just really just want to take a bite, well, at least I would anyway. Uh, Loire, on the other hand, his windows upstairs on the right relied heavily on faceting or chipping the blocks of glass mm -hmm. to provide an important texture once they're up in the vertical plane. Some pieces retain their cast surface, and I took this one deliberately here. This is a piece of cast glass, cast on sand, perhaps, and then cut to make smaller pieces, and then that piece is chipped, so you see this, what we could call oystering. When you hit it with a hammer, can imagine the process a million billion times to get this wonderful faceted surface. And to Loire, those chips act like facets on a gem catching the sunlight. Loire equated his facet faceting with traditional grisaille, an example of which we see here, a centuries-old monochromatic enamel that was used to give subtle shading effects to colored glass, evenly colored glass. Loire said, quote, the cutting or faceting created effects in the glass like those provided in leaded glass by the grisaille. Loire used faceting to, quote, above all, refract and diffuse the light so that it seems to come from within the glass rather than from behind, end quote. Loire also saw his doll capturing and communicating emotion. It was, in his words, quote, a matter of giving glass its full value. When I have a piece of blue glass, where the blue isn't simply the blue of the exterior, it's also the blue of the interior of the piece of glass. It's as if I've made it live, I've made it talk, end quote. The expressiveness of the glass itself was enhanced by how Loire treated the negative space 
in his designs, the concrete, which we might just think as the structure one uses to hold it in place. But in his words, he tried to uh, obtain an equal sumptuousness between the concrete and the glass. And though it functions structurally, like lead caming does in a stained glass window, the concrete in Dal de Ver, at least in, I just threw this up because I couldn't resist it, uh, at least the, the, the concrete in um, Loire's Dal de Ver windows, becomes an active participant in the window's design. His window of fraternal life, we see it here, uh, the overall and then a, is that a detail? No, these are two different windows, excuse me. Uh, is an example of how Loire created a discussion between the positive of the glass and the negative of the concrete. Another defining characteristic of Loire's windows in Sacred Heart Chapel is their abstraction. Loire's first doll windows were figural or representational. They represent something. They have figures. We can think of it that way. They depicted real objects, people, and so forth. For centuries, stained glass windows told the story of the Bible to congregants who could not read or who, at least, could not read Latin. For the Basilica of Lourdes on the right, Loire designed windows that functioned, in his words, quote, as in the old days, a sort of Bible of the people, end quote. But he also used figuralism for complex narratives, such as on the left, a window that relied on Grisaille, interestingly enough, to create the visages of both 20th century prisoners of conscience and those at the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. Loire tailored his approach to the commission. Quote, when a man addresses another man, if he speaks to the Pope, he speaks in one way, with one vocabulary. If he speaks to the butcher in the village, he speaks in another. To a soldier, still in another. For me, it was the same. According to the people to whom I address myself, I spoke in one way or another. It is above all to the people that I address myself, those who will be in the church, end quote. When designing windows for a religious community, such as here at Sacred Heart Convent, he said, quote, the figurative is no longer necessary and the artist can move towards something more abstract, end quote. So no storytelling was necessary here. These windows at uh, the chapel upstairs challenge and require interpretation and cogitation. They invite many viewings and much contemplation, which is perfect for a chapel that, is, that sisters attend daily. The window on the right, to me, is among the most beautiful, uh, uh, it's certainly among the most graphically arresting of the windows in the chapel, and I think the most challenging. Loire left us his interpretations of all the windows, which you can read in the guide that is provided, uh, and it's really quite wonderful, a very short paragraph for each of the windows. Uh, for this window, though, and I, this is the only one I will read to you because you can read, um, <laughs> this window, Apostolic Life, which is on the right, he wrote, quote, light emanating from the interior areas and shining forth to illumine the exterior areas, treated in black and white verticals, depict the spirit of the apostle. At intervals in the tongues, at, at intervals, the tongues of fire of Pentecost recall the work of the mind, the gift of languages, and the conversation, the conversion of the darkness of ignorance into the light of knowledge. End quote. Loire did include some figural elements in several of the windows at Sacred Heart Chapel. They give us a starting point from which to unravel their respective uh, uh, compositions. In the window St. Joseph on the left, if you can't see these, trust me, the one on the left is St. Joseph, Loire uses the fleur-de-lis and a carpenter's hammer to signify St. Joseph. In study, in the middle, Loire places the words holy and peace in Hebrew among open books and, uh, and relies on the Greek letters alpha and omega to suggest the revelation verse, quote, I am the alpha and the and omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In light, on the right, Loire scatters candle flames across a radiant sky. I think the uh, best example of his abstracting figural elements um, uh, to propel the overall composition is in Praise, the window named Praise, where he winds music clefts, staffs, and Georgian square notation up the lancet window towards the heavens. I really think that one is wonderful. In many of his commissions, Loire, Loire favored the color blue, which he said represented to him the color of peace. At the chapel of the Sacred Heart Convent, he used a more controlled palette based on whites and grays to reflect the traditional colors of the Dominican order. 
The windows at the entry on the right in the narthex are more brightly colored, but when one proceeds from the narthex to the nave, the character of the windows completely changes, as we see just a representative example of one on the right. Punctuated with reds and oranges, the restrained palette gives the windows more of a graphic impact, there's that word I'm using again, that when combined with his gestural use of concrete, give the windows an immense power, I think. The windows comprise only one element that give the chapel is its presence. Loire, uh, as was usual, had no control over the building in which his windows would be installed. He would say that his job was to fill the holes left for him by the architect, to cork up the building, in his words, with his work. And it was no different in Sacred Heart. The original drawings call for faceted glass. Can you see that? An understandable translation of Dal de Ver. And then they say NIC. Any guesses? The architects know what that is. Not in contract. <laughs> As harmoniously as the art and the architecture work together, this was not a collaboration. They speak the same modernist language, the art and the architecture, and certainly had full knowledge of each other, but they were created separately, in different hemispheres even. Hadley and Worthington, the firm that created the architecture of the chapel, had a long history at Sacred Heart. And now I'm branching into the architecture of the building. Siena Hall Dormitory at Sacred Heart Academy was designed by Hadley and Worthington the same firm in 1950. It was one of at least four commissions for Sacred Heart Convent and Academy that the firm received before it was hired to design the Mother House in 1962. Earl Worthington, one of the named partners, graduated from Notre Dame in 1927 with a Bachelor's of Architecture. Brian Hadley, the other named partner, attended Crane College. And Hadley and Worthington worked together at the Illinois State's Architect's Office for 10 years, so they knew each other well in the 1930s. They each left that office in the early 1940s, and in 1944, after the war, came together, more or less after the war, came together to found Hadley and Worthington. Worthington, a practicing Catholic, held many memberships and associations that led to several commissions from the Springfield Diocese. Sacred Heart Convent was envisioned as a campus and was designed as one complex with one aesthetic. By 1962, Hadley was 71, Worthington was pushing 60, not that that's old by any means. <laughs> but based on the traditional design of Siena Hall that we just saw, we can assume that the design of Sacred Heart went to younger associates in the firm. Or there was some other miraculous uh, <laughs> conversion that happened to get one of the two to design this. I don't think that was the case. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the younger associates at the firm would have had more recent education, and that education would have been based in more contemporary strains of architectural modernism. So it's a safe assumption. So who were they? Who could they have been? Well, the title block from the original 1965 drawings can help us quite a bit. Hadley and Worthington gave each commission its own job number. There it is. This commission is number 6217. The first two digits represent the year the commission arrived, and the last two was the order in the calendar year that the commissions came. So the Mother House was the 17th commission received in 1962. In the early 1960s, Hadley and Worthington was at its largest with 12 to 14 employees. Kenneth Parker produced many of the drawings for Sacred Heart, and there's his initial drawn by KP. He took correspondence courses in architecture and worked at Hadley and Worthington from 1960 to 1968. A year after he left, he received his architecture license in 1969. We see the initials of uh, one of the named partners, Earl Worthington, ECW, right here. Typically, a partner will approve drawings that go out under the firm's name, but it does not mean that he or she did the design. Aidan Lochner received a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Illinois in 1956 and was a project architect at Hadley and Worthington from 1959 to 1965. And we know from oral histories that Lochner was a main designer for this complex. And this makes sense, as Lochner had a position in the firm high enough to design and check construction drawings, but perhaps not actually draw them. 
Bill Moslowski graduated from the University of Illinois in 1961 with a Master's of Architecture, and he received his architecture license in 1962. He worked for Hadley and Worthington thereafter. In 1965, Moslowski, Lochner, and another colleague left the firm to found their own firm in Springfield. And by the time they left in 1965, the mother house was entirely designed and, it seems, entirely drawn. The key plan on the original drawings shows a tight, some asymmetrical arrangement of buildings on the landscape. The limestone bell tower is at the center of the large city block north to south. The complex is organized around it, and its cross faces the east towards visitors as they arrive in the main parking lot. Living units are arranged in two multi-story buildings anchoring the north and south sides of the campus. Communal spaces are dispersed between the anchors, with the chapel as its own destination in the northeast corner of the complex. The main buildings are pulled apart to fill the west third of an entire city block so that they can then be linked together by windowed walkways that enclose the landscape into courtyards. The corridors protect the inner space of the convent from the outer space of the rest of the world. They insulate access but transmit views. And while they allow residents to circumnavigate the complex without going outside, they provide orienting perspectival views of the complex. And the buildings were built exactly in the superimposed aerial view as the 1965 drawings placed them, with the exception of <laughs> this courtyard building here at the bottom uh, that was never constructed. So there it is as finished and as added on to. This is a recent aerial photo. The buildings read as one cohesive composition, like a modernist campus. And here it is in its original model with that courtyard building here that was never constructed. The reading of the convent as a campus is reinforced by a small, easily overlooked detail, and it's not even really a building in its own right. It's the serpentine wall that defines the campus's southern edge, immediately recognizable as an element drawn from Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia. And while Aidan Lochner may have had the most design input, we know from interviews that Bill Maslowski, who drafted the plans, or was one of the drafters, contributed to the design, including at least these serpentine walls. When he first visited UVA, he saw these walls and was determined to put them in his first project out of school, and he did. <laughs> so I could be flirting with carrying it a, a little too far, but I think we can also see in this project a bit more of a, a literal interpretation of a campus. Jefferson called his University of Virginia an academical village, and what is Sacred Heart, but a religious village. Each links its pavilions with walkways to enclose the landscape and form courtyards or quadrangles as though worlds unto themselves. Each has as its focal point a monumental building raised on a plinth and accessed by a grand stair. Jefferson placed his domed library at the axial center of his world, his campus. Here we have the chapel as this campus's focus, its primacy announced on the exterior by its scale and its raised plinth, and the giant aluminum cross doesn't hurt too much either. <laughs> the architectural vocabulary of Egypt is, of course, entirely different. Georgian in the case of UVA, modernism in the case of Sacred Heart. UVA directly influenced dozens of colleges uh, since, which is why so often they employ Neo-Georgian as their design vocabulary. And a lot of the people at Hadley and Worthington went to the U of I, so they would know from Neo-Georgian. But Sacred Heart looked to other precedents. Among the most famous modernist campus plans is this one by Mies van der Rohe for the Illinois Institute of Technology. It's a low campus, separated buildings laid out on a modular grid, and though very well known to architects by the 1960s, to me personally, IIT just maybe provides us with the concept that strict modernists can, modernism can be successfully applied to a campus plan. I don't really see this as a direct precedent. For, for more specific precedents for Sacred Heart, I think we have to look elsewhere. Sacred Heart Convent, with its sense of scale and enclosure, suggests to me this particular design by Erosarin, 
among the most renowned architects of the 20th century. This pair of residential colleges at Yale was incredibly well published, just as Sacred Heart, uh, the commission for Sacred Heart, was arriving at Hadley and Worthing Worthington. Here we have a mix of building heights, asymmetrically placed to enclose and reveal. Saarinen used masonry walls in unbroken planes, relieved at the ends by vertical slits of windows. And does this all sound familiar to you? Saarinen used the crescent shapes and the lack of right angles to suggest medieval Italian hill towns, like San Gimignano with its fortifications, churches, and towers. At Yale, the rubble masonry is heavily textured and relies on non-orthogonal geometry to create an interesting parapet shape against the sky, the silhouette of the building meeting the sky. The tops of these buildings are capped with a regular smooth line of stone. So at Sacred Heart here, the parapet itself is irregular. And this is just a view of the chapel from the courtyard side. You can see where it meets the sky, a lot of up and down. That's not really how the buildings are organized at Yale. <clears throat> so, at uh, Sacred Heart, the columns rise above the brick walls. The spandrels for the paired windows are below the brick walls. Uh, so what gives? Well, there are other influences that uh, Lochner et al. could have been looking at. American brutalist architecture at the time was uh, very much in the forefront of, of designers' minds. And I think it could be one source for Sacred Heart's changing silhouette against the sky. Brutalist architects like Paul Rudolph, and this is his early masterpiece, the Art and Architecture Building that also happens to be at Yale, were experimenting with cruciform columns with inset centers. You can see that form right here, a large vertical element with a center that is pushed in a bit. Uh, structural components that broke from the mass of the building to become design elements. And I think that Sacred Art Heart owes a debt to these concrete, poetic, and powerful designs. But I also think that its parapet is so suggestive of Gothic crockets and buttresses that these associations must also have been on the minds of its designers. The large beams that support the chapel's roofs, the way up there, are reinforced port in place concrete. And we know that the centers of a, sp a span require less structure, less material than at the ends. So using less concrete in the middle is more economical. But in the chapel, that structural economy sheathed in polished marble, so I don't think money was an object here, also gives us an elegant, pointed Gothic arch. The single open volume of the nave of the chapel, which we see here in plan, may itself seem a bit strange, one giant box. It's not a traditional three-aisle church plan, but this is not a parish church. However, the architect still gave us that traditional plan. It's just not the main focus of the interior. It's the Rosary Chapel, oriented in the traditional east-west manner, and focused on the main altar. The side aisles of, rosaries, of, of Rosary Chapel provide the niches, if you will, for the Stations of the Cross. The cross-axial arrangement of the two worship spaces is something I have never seen before. I'm not familiar with another building that does that. It doesn't mean that there aren't out there. I just happen to not know of one. So Rosary Chapel. Uh, mediates between tradition in its orientation in its real design and modernism. And that mediation continues, I think, in the second artistic expression in the chapel, that of the De Prado Regali studio in Chicago. I've not talked about these yet. There are three main works of De Prado Regali, and they're not based in modernism. The Stations of the Cross, the Altarpiece, and the Mosaic on the East Wall. They possess a slight abstraction, but they are actually quite traditional in concept and the portrayal of figures. Uh, and Sister Mary Linda here made a comment to me that I wish I was smart enough to have thought of myself, um, but I give her full credit. She said that to her, the windows and the architecture were evidence of where the church was going. And the mosaics, the stations, were reminders of where the church had come from. And I thought that was brilliant. That push and pull between the traditional and the modern, we talked about at length earlier with Couturier and all the rest of it, is playing itself out here in Sacred Heart Chapel, whose design was finalized in the same year Vatican II came to a close. Here, the modernist architectural vocabulary subtly hints 
at traditional Gothic. The abstract doll de Vere in frames, the figural mosaic, certainly in the main altar. Here, the three-aisled basilica shares the same altar as the open, inclusive chapel volume. In this inclusiveness, we may find solace and comfort and re relevance and resonance in this wonderful 50-year-old building. So thank you very much. Anthony, thank you so much. When Anthony was here earlier this week to talk with the sisters, so many of them said to me afterward, it's wonderful to see a space that we've been living in for 50 years through the eyes of someone who has Anthony's expertise and uh, sensitivity to the architecture. So we are just thrilled to death and, and so happy. That we have a few minutes. We want to be getting upstairs to chapel uh, for evening prayer shortly, but if there's any questions for Anthony, he'd be happy to entertain some. That's a term. That that's a term that is sometimes used. Slab glass. Sometimes it's slag glass, and I wonder if that's an adulteration of it. A slag glass is just giant chunks of glass that are thrown into a kiln to be melted to make glass. Just giant slag. Slab is when, uh, typically, although it's not a term that is all that much used, is when the glass is cast in very very thick slabs as opposed to window thickness glass, which is not cast, it's blown, and it's, it's a different way of producing it. So I think that slab in that sense, although it's not really a term of art, is one that refers to the doll, these thick cast pieces, that before they're broken up into the individual tesserae that make, that make the windows. Yes? What else is the architectural crime? Oh, well, they've done lots of stuff in Springfield. Uh, what was originally a savings and loan, now the post office on Monroe, is theirs, 1964. Uh, the addition to the Lincoln Casualty Life Insurance Company, what we would know as the AT&T building on 7th, is uh, the addition is theirs. Uh, they did uh, buildings of many different uses. When you look at their entries in an AIA biography, uh, you would put down the numbers of the kinds of buildings that you would normally design. So residential, you get number two. You do a hospital, you get number six or something like that. And you look at Hadley and Worthington, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So they did buildings of every type. So uh, medical as well as office buildings. They also did residences, several different residences. Um, they worked mostly in Springfield, but they had a regional reach. And they did work for the diocese. So they uh, did churches and schools, a lot of school expansions. Uh, in the Springfield Diocese, so you know Decatur, to you know just sort of you know a, a wide circle, but with most of their stuff in um, in Springfield, and then the firm, Paul might know, the firm didn't last too much into the 1970s, as uh, from what I could make out. Started in 1944, and then ended in somewhere in the early to mid 70s. But I don't have that exact year. But they were very good. Yes. Where did the, the actual glass come from? Glass here. Where was it produced? It was produced in France. We do have the town name. I didn't write it down, but it is known. Near Chartres. Near it, yes. He did not make the glass himself, but it was produced near him, and I think that that was his main source for all the time he was making it. It is known. I do not know. Actually, Loire has a second installation of Dal de Ver. He did the doors and side lights to the chapel 
in the education wing of the First United Methodist Church downtown. So in 1967, the First United Methodist Church commissioned an education wing next to it. And in that building, there is a pair, uh, a pair of doors that he did. That's uh, the church downtown now under? Yes, but not in the church. It's in the education building next door. And those are going to be preserved as far as you know? Yes. They're interior doors. Aren't they? they are interior yeah. doors to an interior chapel. <laughs> But the building plans I approved kept them in place. So if they're not, there's a problem. Thank you once again. My pleasure. Let me just give you a little, a little helpful instruction. If your intention is to leave us at this point, which I hope it isn't, um, you may exit out this door. If you're joining us for evening prayer in the chapel, you want to exit out this rear door, and then you have two choices. Just ahead of you, there is a door to a stairway upstairs, or if you want to go around the corner a little bit to the right, there's an elevator. All right. So thank you once again for coming. It's been a delight having you, and uh, we'll conclude our 50th anniversary celebration this evening with evening prayer.